following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. He was a death sentence. An inoperable tumor. Is this really my life? And three to six months to live. This isn't the way that things are going to end. So what could this man do when there was nothing left to do? God is our only hope. There is no other option. And why is he still alive? It was like that seal that it's a done deal. The answers on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club, a big victory for the little sisters of the poor at the Supreme Court. The nuns will not be forced to pay for birth control, and they're not the only winners. Religious schools will no longer be forbidden to fire teachers. Paul Strand begins our coverage. Two huge wins for religious liberty here at the court on one of the very last days of this term. Significant victories on religious liberty today by a margin of seven to two. Uh, and so if anything, this should uh, send a signal to the culture um, that we should all be protecting and valuing and cherishing uh, religious liberty. The religious rights legal group Beckett represented the Little Sisters of the Poor in their fight against the Obamacare mandate to violate their conscience and provide abortion-causing contraceptives through their health care plan. We knew immediately that we could not comply. To do so would have been an irreconcilable contradiction of the belief that guides our ministry and life's work. The Supreme Court has resoundingly declared that religious Americans are entitled to the full protection of the Constitution and of our laws. I'm really bothered when I hear people say this is a victory for religious people as though it's a defeat for non-religious people. This is a victory for all Americans because the principle of uh, religious freedom applies to everyone and a government that's big enough uh, to restrict religious freedom is a government that can do anything. But Sheila Katz of the National Council of Jewish Women complained a person's ability to access birth control should not be dependent on the religious views of their employer or educational institution under the guise of religious freedom. The White House weighed in, stating, twice before in this ongoing saga, the Supreme Court has blocked these overly rigid and misguided efforts and sided with religious freedom. Today, it has once again vindicated the conscience rights of people of faith. But most court watchers believe this saga will add a chapter if the White House changes hands in November. Uh, if uh, a Democrat wins the White House in the next election, I absolutely expect these regulations to change, to go back to something more like the Obama administration's rules that will uh, much more limit the ability of religious ministries to get exemptions from the uh, contraception mandate. So while the Little Sisters are celebrating for now, one day they may have to go through this again. Paul Strand, CBN News, the Supreme Court. Well, it was good news also yesterday in the second Supreme Court ruling. The justices decided that the government has no business telling a religious school or ministry who to hire. Heather Sells explains this huge victory for religious rights. Two California teachers sued their Catholic school employers for not renewing their contracts, alleging discrimination based on disability and age. Seven justices backed the schools, citing what's known as the ministerial exception. It is from a 2012 decision that says the Constitution prevents ministers from suing their churches for employment discrimination. This time, the justices applied that principle to teachers as well. Essentially, they're saying the government has no business telling a Christian school, a church, a ministry whom you hire to teach and promulgate your faith. And so this is a strong victory for uh, ministries and churches and schools everywhere. The court explained when a school with a religious mission entrusts a teacher with the responsibility of educating and forming students in the faith, judicial intervention into disputes between the school and the teacher threatens the school's independence in a way that the First Amendment does not allow. Dissenting Justice Sonia Sotomayor argued the teachers taught primarily secular subjects, lacked substantial religious titles and training, 
and were not even required to be Catholic. Southern Baptist leader Russell Moore said this newly expanded ministerial exception sets a precedent for the lower courts. We really do have a coherent philosophy articulated here that's rooted in uh, the First Amendment, uh, in the Constitution, in uh, legislation such as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, so I think the, the constitutional policy here is very clear. But questions remain because of an earlier case this session in which the court redefined sex discrimination to include sexual orientation and gender identity. The court just went ahead and redefined sex, and that is going to create a secular sexual orthodoxy that religious institutions and religious individuals will probably have to litigate in the courts for many years to come. The two wins for religious freedom could also boost the president's standing. We can tout the fact that these were strong majority decisions, which means that he is in the mainstream of American thought, uh, not just from a public standpoint, but for even at the Supreme Court when it comes to these very important religious liberty issues. But it's only July, and the big question is what issues will be top of mind for voters come November. Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, in other news, wicked weather is on the way with powerful storms in the east and blistering heat in the west. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau. That is right, Pat. A storm brewing in the Atlantic is threatening heavy winds and rain along the mid-Atlantic coast later into today and overnight. Meteorologists say the system could become a tropical depression and possibly strengthen into a tropical storm. It is expected to drift north up the coast with gusty winds, downpours, and possible flooding from North Carolina to New York City. Meanwhile, a heat wave is set to bake the southwest this weekend. Highs in Las Vegas could top 110 degrees in Phoenix. It could be 115 degrees or higher. Well, there's some improvement on the jobless front today. While Americans are still applying for unemployment benefits in the wake of the coronavirus lockdowns, the new initial jobless claims came in at 1.3 million. That's better than expected. Those numbers come after President Trump hosted Mexico's president at the White House to celebrate the newly enacted trade deal with Canada and Mexico. On CBN's Faith Nation program, economist Stephen Moore said the president can help the economy by ending the policy of giving unemployed workers $600 a week on top of existing unemployment benefits. Three out of four workers today are getting more money for not working than working. Not only right. is that unfair to the people who are working, but it also we estimate that we will have 10 million fewer jobs by the end of the year if we extend that policy. So President Trump, if you're listening to this show, do not expand those unemployment benefits. Give everybody a payroll tax cut. And that's, that helps workers and it doesn't hurt businesses. Moore was a Trump campaign advisor in 2016. Well, for the fifth time in nine days, the nation set a new record in coronavirus cases, topping 60,000 on Wednesday. At least five states set records for new infections. California and Texas saw a record number of deaths in one day. At a coronavirus task force briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks called on people in those states to return to lockdown status is really asking the American people in those counties and in those states, in those states to not only use the face coverings, not going to bars, not going to indoor dining, but really not gathering in homes either. Vice President Mike Pence delivered some good news, saying that positive test results for the virus show signs of flattening in some of the worst hit states. Meanwhile, more and more jurisdictions require people to wear face masks. Abigail Robertson introduces us to one group that's trying to make sure everyone who needs a mask can get one. Haley Gottlieb's 15-year-old downtown L.A. apparel factory was one of many businesses indefinitely shut down a few months ago when it was deemed unessential. Thankfully for Haley, when the L.A. mayor issued a call for mask makers, Smart Tees reopened to answer that call for those who can buy the much-needed product and those who cannot. The main goal is just to mask as many people as possible and to make sure that there's nothing in the way of getting people masks that they need. Haley and her business partner knew from the get-go for every mask they sold, they wanted to donate one too. 
But the need for masks was so great at many community centers, they wanted to do more. They were getting donations for sure, um, just not in enough quantity. With the help of her friend Dave Stone, they came up with the Millions of Masks initiative. The first thing that struck me was that once masks were mandated in public, that people didn't have them. Um, and a lot of people didn't know where to get them. When Dave saw the lines at the food bank by his house, he knew he wanted to do something to help. I knew that those folks were probably going to need masks as well. And so for me, I just, it was just down the street from my house. And, you know, the lines at the food banks are a little bit longer today than they were last month or the month before. And there's so many people out of work. Um, you know, at a food bank, you can't, get a, you can't get food unless you have a mask. And oftentimes people are walking up to that food bank and, not, and if they don't have a mask, they can't, they can't get the food that they need to feed themselves or their family. Mom works by people going to their website and choosing a city to donate reusable masks to. Haley makes them at cost. Then their nationwide partners distribute the masks to those in need in their cities. It was really just built out of like understanding that when there's something going on in the world, it's better to rush towards that event as opposed to run away and hide and not do anything. Haley thinks for the time being, masks are here to stay. I think even some of our regular customers who we ship normally just fashion apparel have been adding masks to their collections. I mean, we think it's going to be around at least through the end of this year, possibly into next year. Haley and Dave believe as people start going back into their offices and returning to normal, it won't just be one mask they need, but multiple, as they should be washed after each use. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Great story. Thanks, Abby. Well, we're remembering a historic moment today. It was 35 years ago today that our very own Pat Robertson called for America's embassy in Jerusalem to be moved to, uh, embassy in Israel, rather, to be moved to Jerusalem. In 1985, speaking to a group of college students at APAC, uh, Pat said Tel Aviv is not the capital of Israel. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and has been all the way back to King Solomon. President Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem back in May 2018. Pat? So it shows me I'm a little prophetic, but I, <laughs> I, I knew what had to be. There was such cowardice in the State Department. They didn't want to offend the Arab street, as they called it. And um, they thought there would be a great uprising. When Trump did it, there was no uprising at all. But it had to be done, and it was a historic moment. So, yes, we... All the voices that cried out against it. We, we, but he, we called that a long time ago. All right. Well, coming up later, no other option. That's what was told to this man who had an inoperable brain tumor and just one shot to save his life. What was his last resort? Well, stay tuned to find out. And then up next, it's called the Equality Act, even though it's anything but equal. See how this brazen bill is weaponizing our nation's civil rights laws after this. A few years ago, there was a movie entitled Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the left never sleeps. They won't let us have a nice, peaceful summer. No way, no how. They're going to keep bringing it at us. Every time you turn around, there's something else they're getting ready to do. And this latest one is going to be a shocker. Redefining sex under federal law. That's what the Supreme Court did last month to protect gays, lesbians, and so-called transgenders. Now, Democrats are pushing to expand those rights under the so-called Equality Act. What is the Equality Act? Jennifer Wishon reports this perilous legislation is anything but equal. It's called the Equality Act. Opponents say it's anything but arguing it weaponizes the nation's civil rights laws against Americans who don't conform to the LGBT agenda. Emily Gao, director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation, says the bill forces Americans to live under a new sexual orthodoxy, one that would be imposed on the country by Uncle Sam. It treats the people who believe that marriage is between a man and a woman or that were created male and female, um, it treats our beliefs as race as the equivalent of racist bigotry. 
Female athletes would be required to compete with men identifying as women. Adoption agencies that only place children in homes with a mom and a dad would have to change the way they operate or close. Students attending Bible-believing schools wouldn't be eligible for federal loans. And that's not all. The bill is passed. The Democratic-controlled House passed the Equality Act last spring, and last month emboldened Senate Democrats called it up for unanimous consent in an effort to expedite the bill. Only three Republicans spoke out against it. No person should be discriminated against in America. No one. But Lankford says the Equality Act does just that by elevating the rights of LGBT Americans while dismissing those of Christians and other people of faith. And he points out the bill adds the words perception and belief to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Untested language Lankford predicts would lead to a rash of lawsuits across the country. If I go to interview in a job and I'm not hired, I can sue that employer because I perceive they were thinking I was gay and so they didn't hire me. I don't have to prove anything. It's based simply on my perception or belief. Opponents also say the bill completely guts religious liberty by saying the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that passed Congress overwhelmingly in 1993 doesn't apply as a defense leaving people of faith without any legal recourse. No piece of federal legislation that has ever been passed has ever said that. So what's next? Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden says he'll make enactment of the Equality Act during his first 100 days a top legislative priority. But while Republicans maintain control of the Senate, and as long as there's a filibuster, for now, there doesn't appear to be 60 votes for the bill in its current form. Still, some religious freedom advocates say Republicans can't just keep saying no. How much religious freedom we end up getting in this space, whether it's in the courts or in um, the legislatures, is really going to be dependent on how much common ground we can find with people who also very vigorously support LGBT rights. Just look at Virginia, he says. When Democrats took over the state house this year, they quickly expanded LGBT protections. The only answer social conservatives or conservative Christians have is no. Then as soon as the Democratic Party takes uh, over a, a, you know, a legislature, their answer becomes yes, and their answer becomes yes with no religious freedoms. He points to alternatives to the Equality Act, like the Fairness for All Act, based on a Utah law which restores some protections for Christians, but a number of lawmakers argue not enough. And while racial justice and police reform measures are front and center now, the Equality Act is a top priority for Democrats who will quickly pass it if or when they're given a clear path. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. That's staring into your future unless you do something about it. As I say, they never stop. They never stop pushing. And uh, how do we counter it? Well, we want to talk about the family, but that uh, Religious Restoration uh, Act passed overwhelmingly, and almost every single state opted against uh, the uh, marriage, uh, gay marriage uh, bills, and yet the Supreme Court overturned it, and it's a, it's a mess. But What's going to happen to our country if we let that continue? It, 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 it'll be such a confused mess. And before long, a righteous God will do to us what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to have happen what happened to those old civilizations that have gone down the tube. This is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. But we can't do it if we violate God's law continuously. And that seems to be what is in the forefront of these radicals. And they talk about the, the uh, uh, progressives are pushing Biden and the Democratic Party to the left. And there's a whole lot of stuff. That's, this is only one of items in their agenda. It'll be free education for everybody. Uh, it, it'll be uh, all sorts of uh, laws dealing with uh, uh, free uh, Healthcare, free everything, open the borders to all that want to come in. 
I mean, it will be a mess. And this country that we have loved for so long will not be recognizable if we allow these things to continue. But let me tell you, it's like a steamroller, and you can't go to sleep and say, well, this is vacation time. There is going to be no vacation for these people. They will be hammering away until they get their will. And it's going to be a, a, a fight to the finish. Terry? Well, up next, a jaw-dropping discovery. An MRI revealed this man had a hole in his brain. His neurosurgeon was absolutely floored by it. So how did this shocking news turn out to be good news? Plus, Jesus Culture founder Banning Liebscher invites you to walk not one mile in his shoes, but three. He'll join us live. That's just ahead. Six years ago, Stan Lander was given six months to live. A malignant tumor was growing in his brain and doctors said it was inoperable. That meant Stan and his wife had only one option. What was it? Well, you're about to find out. I couldn't talk and I would try to verbalize things and it was just like I had no voice. This was the second time in two months that Stan Lander felt this strange sensation. I asked him a question and he didn't answer, and so I looked at him and asked again and didn't respond. This time he listened to his wife Alita and went to his doctor, who sent him for an MRI. It revealed a mass on his brain. We were just praying, Lord, whatever this is, we give it to you. We know that you're the healer. The couple had no idea just how much he would need God's healing. After more testing, doctors concluded Stan had a malignant brain tumor known as primary CNS lymphoma. It was rare and in Stan's case, inoperable. It was a death sentence. Yeah, when he said you have, he says you have, you're looking at, you know, three to six months. I was thinking, is this really my life? This isn't the script, you know, that I've been living. This isn't the way that things are gonna end. They're not going to. There's a lot of fear that wants to grip. You can't go there. You just can't. It's like, okay, how are we gonna do this? And we really said, God is our only hope. There is no other option. That Sunday in church, the Landers asked for prayer. You go back and you recount those testimonies where God's come through. So even in the midst of, of that dire prognosis, you know, there was, we, we knew that God was still for us and he had a plan for our life. Later, they went for a second opinion with respected Seattle neurosurgeon known in the community as Dr. Lau. But the report was the same. I agree with the first neurosurgeon that this most likely was tumor or cancer. And I say that uh, from neurosurgical point of view, we cannot do anything much. Dr. Lau is also a pastor. So the only option left is to believe in the miracle that God can heal him. He said, can I, can I pray for you? I've never had a doctor pray for me before. And here Dr. Lau was praying for me. I felt the, the healing of his prayers that night. By now, it had been seven weeks since the first MRI. And as a matter of protocol, Dr. Lau ordered another. Everyone the couple knew, including Dr. Lau's church, continued praying for a miracle. From the human point of view, it's hopeless, but we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. The Lord is giving you a spirit of praise for that. Then a week before the follow-up MRI, Stan and Alita were watching the 700 Club. 
and taking away that heaviness. There's someone else. You've been diagnosed with a brain tumor. It's not a question of whether you have it or not. It's there. You question whether God can heal such a thing. Today, God is setting you free. He's totally healing that tumor. It'll just disappear. We look at each other and go, that's for me. <laughs> and it was just, it was more than icing on the cake. It was like that seal that it's a done deal. So it was just a confirmation that, yes, you don't need to worry. It just contributed to our hope and faith. Yeah. Supported by prayers and hearts full of hope, Stan went for his MRI. A week later, they met with Dr. Lau for the results. There was a sense that this is the MRI that counts. This is one that's gonna tell the story one way or another. This is the one that when you see the picture, your jaw drop. Dr. Lau came in and said, there's a hole in the brain where the tumor was. There's a hole in the brain. You saw the white stuff here. It's all gone, become a cavity. Isn't a hole in the brain still a bad thing? <laughs> and he says, no, it's scar tissue. It's gone, it's completely gone. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops and tell everybody in sight God heals. <laughs> they performed a miracle. We just were laughing and crying, and it was just, it was a fabulous moment. Ever since that day in November 2014, Stan has been the picture of health with no signs or symptoms of brain cancer. I have seen so many supernatural healings in my life. So that's why I believe. It just leaves me in, in awe of God's goodness, of his love for us. I have learned that not to hesitate to pray for people because God just might heal them and there's a good possibility of it. God is so faithful. He's just so faithful. God is good, He's faithful, and He's able. You know, in circumstances that doctors don't have answers for, God, God is so able. Here's another amazing report to encourage people before we pray for them. This is Lucia. In 2016, she said, I was diagnosed with B-cell lymphoma, a disease of the blood. I had treatment for two years. Since then, I've had checkups and my blood levels have stabilized. Last March, I was watching the 700 Club and Pat had a word of knowledge. He said, this is the day of miracles. Someone by the name of Lucia who has a blood disease, God is healing that now. On my next visit to the doctor, he said my blood was perfect. I know the word was for me, I am healed. That's I didn't know miracle. Lucia, but God knew her. Amen. And here's one, Mike, who lives in Chicago. Mike had suffered uh, greatly with the neck, uh, and he was watching our program on June 26th of this year. That's just a few weeks days. ago. A week, a yeah. Weeks ago. And, and Terry said you have a condition on the top part of your spine where it connects to your brain stem. You remember anything about I that? Do remember your that. shoulders are locked up. Your neck is locked. You have headaches. God's setting you free, and Mike says, it's me, and I'm healed. Praise the Lord. Isn't that marvelous? Yes, it's, All right, for listen. Mike, it's more than marvelous. God wants to do something for you right now. God is able. With man, it's impossible, Jesus said. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. So don't say it can't come. I've had this thing forever. Uh-uh. We're going to join hands. Father, in Jesus' name. We believe God right now. We ask you, Lord, that you would do a miracle. God's putting his hand over your shoulders. You know, both shoulders. I, I don't know whether you, uh, you, you've got scoliosis or something like that, but God is healing it. The, the shoulders, everything is straightening out in the name of Jesus. You just feel like God's hand is on you. In Jesus' name, touch them. Terry. Yeah, there's someone named Linda. I don't know your condition, but th this is what I feel you're to know is you've been diagnosed with some serious things and you've just kind of accepted it as just a part of life. God is healing your conditions right now. You are being made completely whole Thank and you. everything bothering you is healed Thank now. You, Lord. 
the power of God is manifesting itself right now in the life of many people in this audience right now. Uh, again, there's a spine. I don't know if you received it before or whether it's somebody else, but wait up. It takes your spine all the way up. Uh, it'll feel like pop, 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 and that whole spine is straightening out. Everything is straight in the name of Jesus. Paula, the thing that you're praying for Thank is Jesus. in the process of being answered right now. Believe for it. Contend for Thank it. You. Stand for it. Expect it in I, Jesus' I believe the one I was thinking about is named Jerome. But take it in Jesus' name. And may the power of God touch everyone in this audience. Receive God's power in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. Mm -hmm. Give us a call, by the way. We'd love to hear from you. It's one 800 700 -7000. If you need further prayer, somebody's there on the phone. Just pick up the phone. No money involved. You just call in. Somebody will pray for you. Okay? Well, coming up, a YouTube favorite, your questions and Pat's honest answers. Diana says, my kids are grown and most of my grandchildren also. I have friends that have things they focus on and I just feel lost. What's wrong with me? Stay tuned for Pat's answer, plus the three mile walk. What is it and how can it help you? Jesus Culture founder Banning Liebscher has the answers for us later on today's show. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. George Floyd told Minneapolis police officers he couldn't breathe more than 20 times in the eight minutes before he died. All the while, the officer who pressed his knee into Floyd's neck dismissed those pleas, saying, quote, it takes a heck of a lot of oxygen to talk. That's according to transcripts of the body camera video, which was released Wednesday. The transcripts provide the most detailed account yet of what happened when Floyd died in police custody back in late May. Well, Attorney General Bill Barr says he believes black Americans are treated differently by police than other people. He made those remarks in an interview with ABC News. You know, I do think that it is a, uh, a, a widespread phenomenon that, that uh, African American uh, males particularly are treated with extra suspicion and maybe not given the benefit of the doubt. The attorney general said the issue needs to be addressed, but he opposes the defunding the police movement. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Banning Liebscher was just 25 years old when he started what became the international phenomenon known as Jesus Culture. Today, he continues his passion to see people thriving in every area of their lives. Take a look. Banning Liebscher is a popular pastor, speaker, and author. He founded Jesus Culture in 1999 at Bethel Church in Redding, California, a ministry of worship, conferences, and leadership development. Banning says that many believers are discontent, sensing there's more to the Christian life than they're experiencing. My heart as a pastor is to come alongside people and encourage them to engage the call that God has on their life. In Banning's newest book, The Three Mile Walk, he explains how to live the life God wants for you. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Banning Liebscher. Banning, welcome. It's nice to have you with us. Uh, it's so great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. I love the book. You, in your role as a youth pastor and then as initiator of the Jesus Culture and your international travels and conferences, say that many Christians are discontented with their lives. Why is that? Yeah, you know, my heart really as a pastor, which I've been doing for 25 years now, is to really come alongside people and have them experience the fullness that God has for them. And I really think the fullness that God has for them is connected to saying yes to the call of God in your life. And that ultimately, you every single believer has a call in your life, and you have a call to be someone and a call to do something. God's trying to shape you and mold you. 
to look like Jesus, and he's asking you to partner with him in his plans and purposes in the earth. So I think that we find ourselves dissatisfied when we're not actually engaging the call that God has on us. Well, you have a passion to inspire people to thrive in their faith. So, you know, recognizing your call can can happen from day to day as you move along in your relationship with God. What do we need to do to come to that place of thriving? Yeah, well, I, I think you just have to, uh, obviously, I think the, the Christian life is one big yes. <laughs> like like that you would just say yes to Jesus and all that he's asking of you. And, and I think as you take this journey, I think you're right. As we walk with Jesus, what's he asking of us? What's he wanting to do in my life? Am I paying attention to those things? Like, am I on the journey with Jesus and paying attention to the things that he's wanting to do in my life and he's wanting to do through my life? And I think when we position our life to walk with him and to be obedient and to pay attention to the things that are in my heart, to what he's asking of me, I really think that's the place where we kind of find that thriving and that abundance. I love the the Old Testament story that you use as a, a blueprint sort of throughout what you write in the book is the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. And what tell us what the significance of that story should be yeah. for us as believers. Yeah, well, you know how there are certain stories in Scripture that just kind of resonate with you from early on? This is one of them. And it's this incredible picture. You know, if you grew up in church at all, you'll know the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer, how he goes to take on the Philistines. But it's a picture, actually, of this contrast between Jonathan and his dad, King Saul. And King Saul is content to sit underneath a pomegranate tree looking at a distance to the Philistines. But, but Jonathan, something awakened in the heart of Jonathan where he just said, I'm not content to sit any longer. I am going to get up and I'm going to engage what God's called us to. I'm going to move forward. And uh, so the reason why it's called the Three Mile Walk is that the, Phil- that, that the Israelites are on one hill and the Philistines are on the other. And in between that geographically is a valley and it's three miles. It's a three mile valley that Jonathan had to go on. So when Jonathan said, yes, I'm going to get up and move forward in what God's called me to, he started a three-mile walk uh, to, to engage that. And, and so much stuff is needed on the three-mile walk that we unpack. But that's why I love the story, because it shows Saul and the army who were somehow content to sit from a distance and look at their destiny, and Jonathan, who I really believe God put a divine dissatisfaction in him that said, I don't want to sit anymore. I want to get up and go. I believe it's such a story for us today as believers in the world that we are living in. But you talk about three characteristics that are necessary for us to develop so that we can live the life that God intended for us, the call that you suggest. Will you talk about those characteristics? Yeah, well, we kind of put them as three miles since it worked out. but, uh, (laughs) But it's holiness, courage, and faith. And uh, my heart was to really relook at holiness again. Uh, holiness is, uh, y- you know, holiness is the first call in our life. We are called to be set apart. If you're going to engage the call of God in your life, you have to engage holiness. But try to unpack that a little bit more and talk about relation. It's it's a relational concept. Uh, I grew up in an environment where it's a list of do's and don'ts, and it was more don'ts than do's rather than this relationship with Jesus. And then just courage and faith. I mean, the reality is, and for anybody who's got up and gone after Jesus and going after the call of God, what you find quickly is that it takes a massive, massive amount of courage. It takes a huge amount of courage to do what God's calling you to do, both to become who He's calling you to become and to do what He's calling you to do. And so my heart is just to come alongside and put courage inside of people and just to really tell them, Listen, the enemy comes to discourage you. He's trying to disarm you of your courage. And so we have to position our lives to live full of courage and encouraged if we're going to walk this journey out. And in the end, you know, the goal, of course, is to walk in the call of God on your life. Do you think most people today have a sense of what that is? Yeah, you know what? I, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I can't talk for everybody, but I think a lot of people are not fully aware of what God's called them to. Uh, I talk about in the book, even dreaming again, uh, really allowing yourself to dream. How do, you, how do you know what God's calling you to? How do you pay attention to this thing? In, in, I mean, it, it, the world is so busy right now. And I, I think we've got our attention on so many other things that if we can just stop long enough, get our internal world healthy 
and pay attention to where God's leading us. You know, we say all the time that we're spirit led believers, but, but many times I'm like, I don't know if we're spirit led believers. I think we're just busy led believers. I think we're just, you know, chaos led believers and distracted. And so my heart is really just to say, listen, you're going to be most alive, most thriving when you're following Jesus on this journey of engaging your call. Well, you outline it so beautifully in the three mile walk and uh, what believer doesn't want to walk in the kingdom purposes that God has for them. And one of the things Banning says in his book, The Three Mile Walk, is this is everybody. You know, there's nobody that is following Jesus that shouldn't and doesn't have a call on their lives. So be sure you don't waste time without finding out what your call is. This book is a great way to walk that path. And Banning, we thank you so much. It's really been wonderful to have you with us today. Oh, thank you for having me on. I want to say, by the way, The Three Mile Walk is available wherever books are sold. Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions and Pat's got some honest answers. Linda says, please explain how the word of knowledge works. How do you know that you'll receive it when you pray? Good question. The answer is coming up. Hey, you're watching the 700 Club, and it's a great day to be alive, and we're glad you're with us. Well, each month, Andrew Riley sits down and says, who am I going to give money to? It's actually his favorite time of the month. Andrew and his wife, Bridget, are both generous givers, and you're about to see why. Andrew and his wife, Bridget, love to give. There are specific laws that God requires of us, and so 10% in our household is just it's, just, it's a regular thing. Giving is the most fun time of the month. I get to finally say, sit down and say, yes, who am I gonna, you know, who am I gonna give this to? Andrew is a successful investment manager who started tithing when he got his first job at 21. He later discovered that there's a correlation between what he was giving and what he was making. So I just experimented. Let's see what happens when we go from like say tithing net to gross and my income doubled that year. And uh, I never forgot that. For Bridget, it wasn't until she married Andrew in 2009 that she made tithing a priority. She says it didn't take long for her to realize what she had been missing. God has blessed us so immensely and we should be good stewards with everything that we are being given. In addition to giving to their church, the Rileys are CBN partners. We never think twice about where our dollars are going when we give to CBN. Whether it's a hurricane or it's somebody that needs a surgery in another country, we know that to do that on our own, we're not going to be as effective. And to see CBN, the amount of work on the scale that they do, it's just radical. Their favorite CBN ministry is Superbook. Andrew watched the classic Superbook as a child, and he remembers how it strengthened his faith at such a young age. Superbook might be CBN's most important ministry. I would love to see it in every language and just keep the outreach going across the world. Joy and Chris and Gizmo combined with the Superbook, the biblical side of it has helped the kids understand and recognize who they are and what the Lord says about them. The Rileys give at the chairman's circle level. They challenge everyone to give more and see God bless you beyond measure. God expects you to be a good steward with your money, that he can trust you to continue to pour back out what he's pouring into you, because it isn't for you. Giving is the only time where money leaving the account actually feels good. It leaves me, goes to someone else, and it's a great reward, and it's a great feeling, and it's a great privilege. You know, as long as that dollar stays in your wallet, it's going to just stay there all by its little lonesome. But if you take it and put it in God's hands, and suddenly it begins to multiply. God's got a, a wonderful system where he says, prove me with your tithes and offerings if I won't pour, open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you cannot contain it. Now, that's what the Bible says. I personally practice that, believe it, and uh, CBN has been able to do that along the way, and the Rileys did the same thing. And y y if you want to... You're not supposed to test God. That's a sin. But he did say, prove me with this. I mean, you test him with giving. And he says, look at what, if you'll just 
prove me, I'll, I'll do something wonderful for you. We've got something called, do you need a miracle? I want to give it to you as our gift to thank you for what you're doing. It's 1-800-707-000. And we'd love you to join the 700 Club. They happen to be founders. There's various levels of $10, $20, $100. He that sows liberally shall reap liberally. So if you want to, you know, if you're, if you're a farmer, and you take one peck of grain and scatter it around your field, you're not going to get a very big harvest. But if you, if you want to have a big harvest, you want to sow enough seed so that you can reap more. So again, pick up the telephone, call in 1-800-700-7000. We'd love to hear from you. And when, when you join the 700 Club, again, I want to give you this DVD. Do you need a miracle? These are real life stories of tremendous miracles that have happened in people's lives. Yes, ma'am. Time for some questions. You ready? Let's go for questions. Okay, this is Diana who says, My kids are grown and most of my grandchildren also. My husband's job keeps him very busy. I have friends that have things they focus on and I just feel lost. What is wrong with me? I used to have passion about things, but there's always a conflict within that drives me away. Uh, you want to have some fun? Start asking God for something uh, unusual and believe God for it. I mean, really step out and begin to believe God and just pray like, Lord, I'm, I pray for whatever, the, the potholes in the front of my apartment to be filled, or I pray for social justice, or I pray that I may have a job. And watch what God will do. I mean, just begin to talk to him, and you'll find there's an excitement you could not believe, okay? This is Linda who says, please explain how the word of knowledge works. It seems that every time you pray, you receive words of knowledge. How do you know you'll receive them when you pray? Well, you don't. <laughs> uh, you know, if you read about the enablements of the, of the Holy Spirit, the word of knowledge is one of them. It's something that doesn't come through the senses. It's something given by God. It's not some psychic thing or anything. But... Um, God will speak to us about somebody and actually give us a name. And how do you know? Well, by reason of use. There's no way you can start unless you just do it. I mean, by reason of use, the senses are exercised that you can discern good from evil. So that's how. But the Apostle Paul said, desire the better gifts, especially you may prophesy. So ask God for more and he'll give it to you. All right. This is Eric who says, why do so many people, including the 700 Club, reference scripture in the Old Testament, especially Psalms? I thought after the resurrection, only scripture in the New Testament had an effect on us and was relevant to our lives. Um, you know, one day I was praying and I started reading Isaiah 58. And it said, is not this the fast that I've chosen that you may uh, deal your bread to the hungry and so forth? And then it said, when you do this, your light's going to shine speedily, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard, and God will, you will call, and God will answer you. And I said, man, that's the Old Testament, but I want it. I, I don't care what it is. That's how we started Operation Blessing, and we've probably given out about five, I don't know, it's about two, two to three billion dollars. We help about 300 million people around the world. But it all started with the fact that there was something in the Old Testament. The Bible was given by God. And not all of it's relevant. The, the, the dietary laws are not relevant. Uh, some of the other restrictions aren't. And the one thing is do unto others, you do and have them do unto you. So, but nevertheless, there's certain moral principles that are still normative for everybody, all right? This is Virginia who says, hi, Pat. For a long time, I've been in favor of one of one six-year term for our presidents. It would reduce the years of wasteful campaigning, the huge spending, and it would give some breathing room for a president and Congress to actually get some important legislation accomplished. With your knowledge of government and politics, what do you think? Um, oh, this whole thing has been debated quite a bit. When our country was founded, there was no limit. I mean, a president could run for four years and then he could run again uh, for another four and another four. Uh, Roosevelt was in for four terms, and the people said that's just too much to Roosevelt. We've had a, you know, but he was so popular uh, that they just kept keeping him in. So we we had a change in policy that he could only have two terms. 
Um, in Virginia, we have a one-term deal, which wouldn't work too badly. He's in for four years, and then he's out of there. So, uh, But at the same time, they get to be lame ducks and, and uh, the last year or so of their uh, administration. But, you know, six years, I mean, why? Uh, you know, and, and again, uh, Congress, uh, especially the, the House, doesn't want to get people going after them. So that they've limited these terms. Uh, their term is two years and then they, uh, off again. And, and the Senate doesn't want to let them do anything more because the senators don't want the House members running against them. So th there's a lot of confusion, but I, I don't think six years is a good thing. We, we've got four. A guy can come in for a second term, period, end of story. That's, a, that's pretty good, all right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty much all the time we have for today. Oh, Give me oh. any more. It's going to take us over the, well, the top of the hour. So I was looking forward to more. <laughs> thank you for your questions. I hope I answered them on it as best we can. And thank you so much for being with us. Tomorrow, uh, today's Power Minute is from the Psalm 68. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Well, tomorrow, the talk, what is it? Why do black parents have this conversation with their sons? Well, you'll find out on tomorrow's 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, thank you for being with us. And Lord willing, tomorrow, there'll be another edition of the 700 Club. Don't miss it. Bye-bye.